guys, Justin here, coming at you with another NBA video. Uh, this one, a more topical NBA video as it pertains to carry jobs uh, in the NBA. Many people are uh, currently on the bandwagon of LeBron's, quote, great carry job of the Cleveland Cavaliers through the 2017-18 season to the NBA Finals and the potential of his, quote, carry job of a bunch of misfits and those who were misguided and outcast from the league in the current Los Angeles Lakers lineup and just how great of a carry job would that be if that was to happen? Well, I'm here to tell you that Hakeem Olajuwon has had a bigger or did have a bigger carry job than LeBron James in carrying the 1994 championship Houston Rockets and the 1995 championship Houston Rockets. So without further ado, let's get into it. Just to give some perspective, Hakeem's resume over the 93-4 and 94-5 seasons are as follows. Two championships, two finals MVPs, two all-star selections, two top five MVP finishes with an, a single MVP win. A defensive player of the year, one all-NBA first team, one all-NBA third team, we'll get to that in a little bit, and one all-defensive first team, uh, certainly one less than he should have. But nonetheless, a pretty impressive resume for Hakeem over two seasons considering the carry job he had to commit. As we look at the combined resume outside of Akeem through the 93-4 and 94-5 seasons, this is not including the championships they won. There was one previous championship winner who was a bench warmer and only played five games on the uh, 1983 championship Sixers team. And one All-NBA third team, which went to Clyde Drexler. He had been traded that season from Portland just after the All-Star break. Uh, we will get to that. And as I mentioned, that is outside of the championships won in these years. So pretty much stuff all available to Hakeem Olajuwon uh, as far as a all-around resume is concerned for his teammates. As we break down Hakeem in 93-94, Elijah Wan uh, became the undisputed best player in the NBA following the retirement of what many people were already calling the GOAT at that point, Michael Jordan. Of course, Michael's father had been murdered prior to the start of the 93-4 NBA season. Uh, a lot had been building on him uh, after his father's passing and the fact that his father always wanted him to go and play baseball. I mean, for those of you that doubt that, go and watch Jordan rides the bus. Uh, his baseball stint was no joke. Um, and Michael was even willing to go and play in the majors. Had the, had the uh, lockout not occurred, uh, and he didn't want to be one of those players that was just filling in a spot in the major team for someone who had real potential. He didn't want to be seen just as a minor league guy who got a boost purely because of the lockout. A lot of speculation to do with Michael's gambling, but at the same time, when you look at just how much revenue and how much ratings dropped in the NBA uh, in 93-4 and the start of 94-5, you'll see that that certainly was a rumour that can be uh, dispelled. Hakeem was the only all-star on the 93-4 Houston Rockets team. And with a starting lineup of Otis Thorpe, uh, not many of you will know who Otis Thorpe is. He was an all-star in 91-92, a decent big man in his own right, but certainly wasn't the player he had been uh, two seasons prior. Rob Ory was only a young player in the league, had just come off a rookie season, wasn't the big shot bulb we knew, but still an all-around player. Vernon Maxwell, Mad Max, as many people knew him as, was a psychotic, competitive son of a gun. Um, you can even find footage of Vernon Maxwell going into the stands to fight fans. And Kenny Smith, who was known as the Jet now, the TNT broadcaster, um, who certainly at every opportunity he gets, thanks Elijah one for his two championships, and you'll see why throughout this video. Uh, they were pretty much thriving off Hakeem's energy on both ends of the floor. I mean, Elijah one as you can see, won the MVP and Defensive Player of the Year in the same season of 93-94, while also garnering an All-Star selection, All-NBA First Team selection, and All-Defensive Team selection. So while Hakeem was burdening both ends of the floor, um, he was voted the most valuable player in the league and the league's best defensive player. We'll get to just how important this part of his resume is in the near future. But just think about that. Not only was he the most valuable player in the league, he was also regarded as the best defender in the league. So best all-around player in the league, which is what the MVP really should be. It's really gone away from that in the past few seasons. But the most valuable player in the league, the best all-around player in the league and the most valuable to his team. Clearly, I mean, how many of you guys could name outside a big shot Bob and Kenny Smith, 
and I mean Kenny Smith even then is only really known at the moment for his television stint. Uh, could name anyone on that 93-4 Rockets lineup. As I mentioned, no other All Stars on the 93-4 Rockets team outside of Elijah Wan, and I mean his season was one of the uh, great seasons uh, in NBA history. And as I mentioned, MVP, DPOY, All Star game, All NBA first team, and All Defensive selections for Hakeem in 93-94. Continue on, continuing on through 93-94 as the playoffs rolled around, speculation began to rise in regards to if Elijah Wan could overcome his previous playoff shortcomings. Elijah Wan hadn't been to the championship round since the uh, fabled loss against the Celtics in 1986. Of course, Boston, so the Boston Celtics in 1986, arguably the greatest all-around team uh, in NBA history. 67 wins, 41 at home in the regular season, they were absolutely dominant. Larry Bird, Kevin Kale, Robert Parrish, Dennis Johnson, Danny Ainge, uh, Scott Wedman, Rick Carlisle, Bill Walton, coached by KC Jones. They were a deep team, quite capable of overcoming the odds. Uh, and they faced a young Elijah Wan and Sampson and a pretty coked up Rockets team who soon fell apart in the following years. Elijah Wan was actually struggling to get through uh, even to the second round with no one about him to the point where he was tempted to even quit the team into early retirement or request a trade. But after the team soon realised what they had around them, they started to somewhat build. Of course, the build wasn't that great, but uh, Hakeem's talents just allowed them to continue. So there were a lot of doubts in 93-4 as to whether he could uh, get past the second round and indeed get to that championship round. And it was quite difficult for him. I mean, he went through a nightmare Western Conference. The Western Conference now is a nightmare. If these teams back then played today, there'd be no chance of there even being conferences in the league. They'd soon probably eliminate that idea and certainly restructure the playoffs. I mean, they went through uh, the nightmare of the Portland Trailblazers, who two seasons prior had been to the NBA Finals. The Phoenix Suns, uh, who had been to the NBA Finals the year previous, and we all know about the Utah Jazz team of the 90s, who would eventually move uh, to play back-to-back -back final series in 97-8. All of these teams would eventually or had, make, had or would make the NBA Finals, as I outlined. And some of the great players on these teams included Clyde Drexler and the Blazers, Charles Barkley, the uh, reigning defending MVP uh, of 93 of 92, the uh, reigning MVP of 92-3 was defending his crown in 93-4, along with Kevin Johnson, who was still one of the best point guards in the league. Uh, John Stockton and Carl Malone, Stockton to Malone, probably the best one-two tandem in league history on a pick and roll. Uh, and I mean, what else needs to be said there? Arguably the best pure point guard in league history and a two-time NBA MVP, 36,000 point player in Carl Malone. Continuing on, sorry, continuing on through 93-4, after making it through the Western Conference, Elijah Wan had a chance to cement his all-time season with a championship against a dominant New York Knicks team. Uh, the Knicks, just for some information, shout out to uh, Knicks fans out there, the Knicks never actually beat the Bulls in a playoff series when Michael Jordan played. Um, they defeated the Scottie Pippen-led Bulls uh, in 93-4 in the semi-finals, defeated the Pacers in the conference finals, and then went on to play uh, the Elijah Wan-led Rockets. Uh, and again, led by Patrick Ewing, who's arguably the greatest Nick of all time. And for everyone that wants to criticise Ewing uh, and his shortcomings, the Knicks would be nowhere near where they got to without Patrick Ewing. I mean, would have been, again, had Ewing had won, it would have been one of the greatest carry jobs of all time as well. And he very well could be in the conversation here. But went up against Patrick Ewing, one of the meanest two-way players in league history. You know, a guy who nearly blocked 3,000 points and scored 3,000 uh, shots, sorry, and scored upwards of 23, 24,000 points himself. A dangerous player, Patrick Ewing. Uh, so again, he had to cement his all-time legacy one thing that certainly hurt this series was uh, the O.J. Simpson saga uh, in the double homicide of which he was, uh, the double murder, I should say, first degree murder, of which he was acquitted from, um, was most famously going on around here. I mean, they even had games that were interrupted uh, through proceedings and famously interrupted by the Bronco chase. But Hakeem Elijah won 93-94. They were down at 3-2. Uh, heading into Game 6, and it looked like the Knicks were going to steal another one and win the championship on the road against Houston. But Elijah Wan made one of the most historical defensive plays in finals history and managed to double-team off a screen, uh, roll over to John Starks and get the game-saving block um, from a three-point winning attempt. 
Uh, again, save the Rockets and advance to Game 7, where they eventually claimed their first NBA championship at home. And the Rockets, actually, from what I can remember, are the only recent team uh, in history, I believe, outside of the Heat. Other than the Heat, are the only team since uh, in recent history to win two championships in a row, uh, both winning them on their home floor. The Bulls never actually managed to do it. The Lakers in their three-peat never did it. Uh, the Lakers of 0-9-10 never did it. The Heat of 12-13 did, and the Warriors have yet to do it. So uh, pretty much since 1990, one of two teams to win back-to-back uh, championships on their home floor. And again, this was on the back of Elijah Wan, who was named the finals MVP and in the process became the first and only player in history to win both the league MVP, defensive player of the year, and finals MVP in one season. An absolutely dominant performance from Akeem Olajuwon in 93-94, who realistically only uh, 13 years prior had only just been taken into college and 15 years prior had only just started playing the game of basketball. So in 15 years uh, to have moved on from having not really played the game to having one of the greatest seasons in league history, uh, just unfathomable. And, I mean, you've only got to look at Hakeem's numbers in 93-94. They were ridiculous. In the regular season, he averaged 27.3 points, 11.9 rebounds, 3.6 assists, 1.6 steals, 3.7 blocks. Now, again, look at that. 1.6 steals, 3.7 blocks. An absolute beast on both ends of the floor and on and off the ball for defense. 3 or 4, 3.4 turnovers expected for a big, but shot tremendously well. In fact, the standard by which a lot of bigs are measured on their scoring efficiency and shooting ability. 52.8 from the field, 42.1 from deep, and 71.6 from the free throw stripe. Elijah Wan was deadly anywhere inside of 18 feet uh, on jumpers and fadeaways. And I mean, everyone knows that he's probably got the best footwork ever uh, in the low post. In the playoffs, he raised his overall ability once again. 28.9 points, 11 point, uh, sorry, 11 rebounds, 4.3 assists, 1.7 steals, 4 blocks, 3.6 turnovers, 51.9 from the field, 50% from deep and 79.5 from the strike. Uh, and then in facing probably his best direct competition, uh, Mano Amano in Patrick Ewing, his numbers did dip a bit. And that is all respect to Patrick, who unfortunately was clearly outplayed by Elijah Wan. 26.9 points, 9.1 rebounds, 3.6 assists, 1.6 steals, 3.9 blocks on 3.6 turnovers, 50% from the field, 100% from deep, and 86% from the foul line. A dominant series from Elijah Wan, and one the likes of which we thought we may never see again, never see again, as far as a carry job is concerned. That was until 1994-95 rolled around. And coming off uh, his best season ever, and one of the best seasons in league history, Hakeem was determined to remain the king of the now MJ-less NBA. Uh, a lot of people will sit there and go, well, uh, had MJ been there, they probably wouldn't have beat the Rockets. So that's very well and true. And there is a case to be made, considering there were, was always a concern that the Bulls, when they did play a big marquee centre, they did occasionally struggle in defending him. But the way they played their game, they were able to negate the way uh, the centre position worked. So probably wouldn't have mattered anyway, but there's no doubt about it. Uh, great players did get their own. I mean, you've only got to look uh, at Gary Payton and Sean Kemp in 96. They were able to get their own against the 72 and 10 Bulls. Certainly wasn't their fault. They just ran into the greatest team ever. Uh, don't believe me, include the playoffs in the regular season. They got the greatest wing percentage ever. Things that didn't go so well for the Rockets, um, though, uh, however, as their early regular season form, they opened the season with nine straight wins, they began to trail off, and it caused a lot of frustration among the team, to the point where Clyde Drexler was traded for uh, from Otis Thorpe. He'd done his time there uh, in Portland, and in fact wasn't even nominated to the All-Star game that year. So Hakeem, again, the only All-Star uh, as far as the 94-5 Rockets were concerned. Uh, and Drexler joined the team just after the All-Star weekend. And while Drexler's, uh, r you know, joining the team was welcomed, uh, he was a welcomed addition to the team, the Rockets managed to finish with a record of just 47-35 in what is an absolutely rugged Western Conference of the mid-90s and placed them uh, as the sixth seed uh, uh, in the West and their championships defence was looking all but gone, um, and that's certainly understandable when you see the gauntlet that this team had to run through. As I mentioned, with Drexler uh, on the team, he was eventually nominated to the All-NBA third team 
along with Elijah Wong, who made the All-NBA third team. Uh, the poor performance of the Rockets was certainly a big factor here. And noticeably, Elijah Wong wasn't even nominated to any of the defensive teams, which is quite remarkable when you actually look at the numbers he posted, and generally because Hakeem was just that good. Elijah Wong, like Jordan, was robbed of probably a few Defensive Player of the Year awards, and certainly, unlike Jordan... Um, was robbed of some all-defensive teams. There's no doubt about that. The task presented to the Rockets in the Western Conference playoffs was nothing short of impossible to survive, though. In their first-round matchup, they faced the 60-22 Utah Jazz at Carl Malone and John Stockton. Malone finished third in the MVP voting, while Stockton finished eighth in the MVP voting, and both were all in the all-NBA first team. After that, they then went on to face the 59-23 Phoenix Suns of Charles Barkley, who finished sixth in the MVP voting and made the all-NBA second team. And then finally would move on to the 62 and 20 San Antonio Spurs of David Robinson and Dennis Rodman. That's right, Rodman uh, played for the Spurs that year. Robinson was the MVP while Rodman finished 12th in MVP voting. Rodman, uh, sorry, Robinson made the All NBA first team. Rodman the All NBA third team, and both made the All Defensive first team. Elijah won under these circumstances, going against one of the greatest collection. Uh, collections of talent and uh, power forward centres the league has ever seen managed to wheel the Rockets through to the NBA Finals. Unbelievable stuff there. Someone tell me exactly who the hell LeBron James faced in the 17-18 uh, playoffs in the weakest Eastern Conference the league has ever seen um, and pushed a team like that through to the NBA Finals. I didn't see it happen. And again, we only have to have a look after completing one of the most impressive conference playoff runs in the history of, in the history of the NBA. Elijah Wan was tasked with leading the Rockets past the 57 and 25 Orlando Magic, which featured Shaquille O'Neal and Penny Hardaway. Shaq finished second in MVP voting uh, to David Robinson. Uh, Penny finished tenth in MVP voting. Uh, Shaq made the All NBA second team, while Penny was adjudged to be uh, the All NBA first team uh, alternate guard there. Uh, an absolutely dominant run there by that Orlando Magic team. A Magic team which eliminated the 94-5 Chicago Bulls with Michael Jordan, which a lot of people like to hold over Michael, but that's due for another uh, video uh, in another time. And with momentum on their side, the Rockets uh, managed to sweep the Orlando Magic off the floor and claim their second championship. That's right, a team that finished 10 games behind the Orlando Magic managed to sweep them off the floor in the NBA Finals. That's right. The second best player in the league at the time uh, as judged that year in Shaquille O'Neal. Penny Hardaway, uh, arguably the best guard in the league at that time. Tenth in MVP voting. All-NBA first team. Certainly had the credentials. Uh, was swept off the floor by Elijah Wong. And the Rockets had no home court advantage at that point uh, despite the fact that they faced the worst opponent they faced in that run was 10 games clear of them. So again... Having no home court advantage, Elijah Wan led the Rockets to the promised land past their opponents who had no less than 10 game advantage on them all playoffs. Unbelievable stuff here from Akeem Elijah Wan. And again, you've only got to look at Elijah Wan's numbers in 94-95 to understand how his repeat numbers were just simply astounding. In the regular season, 27.8 points, 10.8 rebounds, 3.5 assists, 1.8 steals, 3.4 blocks, and didn't make either defensive team, it must be added. 3.3 turnovers, 51.7 from the field, 18.9 from deep, but you will know just how little the three-point bomb was relied upon back then, which is a big um, misunderstanding that a lot of fans have today. 75.6% from the free throw line. Again, good all-around shooting numbers there. In the playoffs, 33 points, 10.3 rebounds, 4.5 assists, 1.2 steals, and 2.8 blocks. He did drop off a little bit, but, I mean, kind of understandable when you just saw who the hell he had to run through. 3.3 uh, turnovers. His shooting actually went up 50.3%. 53, sorry, 53.1% from the field, 50% from deep, 68.1 from the free throw line. Slightly understandable, but all bigs with his ability. Should be around the 70% mark, so maybe a little underwhelming. Then again, look who he went through. And in the finals against Shaquille O'Neal, a young, primed, athletic Shaquille O'Neal, 32.8 points, 11.5 rebounds, 5.5 assists, two steals, two blocks, 2.8 turnovers. Shaq held him to 48.3% from the field, which is by no means a shot at Elijah Wan uh, or Shaq. 
100% from three, took one, made one. In fact, the three-pointer that he did take was over Shaq in the corner uh, to end the championship run. And 69.2 from the free throw line. Reasonably consistent all uh, playoffs and all season from there. To summarise what happened with Elijah Wan carrying that Rockets team between 93-94 and 94-95, Elijah Wan only once had another teammate who was selected to an All-NBA team. And at no point was a teammate of his selected as an All-Star during this run. Elijah Wan faced the 10th and 6th placed in MVP voting Charles Barkley, the 7th and 3rd placed in MVP voting Carl Malone, and 11th and 8th placed John Stockton uh, in MVP voting, a 5th placed Patrick Ewing in MVP voting, an MVP caliber David Robinson, a 2nd placed Shaquille O'Neal in MVP voting, a 10th placed Penny Hardaway in MVP voting, and a 12th placed Dennis Rodman in MVP voting. The team opposition he faced included at least one team of 47 wins, five teams of at least 50 wins, and two 60 win teams en route to the championship, both years. To continue with the summary, the Rockets of 93-94 at the time were the third lowest scoring supporting cast in NBA history to win a championship. Only the Chicago Bulls of 91-2 and 92-3 were worse off. That, the, that Rockets team currently is now ranked number 10 in NBA history. So to give you an idea, while also carrying the scoring for the then third worst supporting cast ever to win a ring, 93-94 Elijah Wan was also voted the best defender in the league. That is a bona fide carry job if I've ever heard one. You anchor the third worst scoring supporting cast in league history to a championship and you're voted by pretty much everyone to be the best defender in the league. Pretty much carried both ends of the floor. Thank God the, the guys on that team played their roles because they were all role players. There's no doubt about that. Because if they hadn't applied their roles, there's no doubt about it. They don't get near the championship. So credit to them. But my goodness, if Elijah Wan wasn't there, they were a lottery team at best. Again, let me reiterate this. By also carrying the scoring for the then third worst supporting cast to ever win a ring, Hakeem Elijah Wan in 93-94 was also voted the best defender in the league. Unbelievably ludicrous. And just to top it all off, in 94-5, the Rockets became the only team in history to win an NBA championship from as low as the sixth seed. Practically the worst back-to-back -back team in league history. Oh, and he went through the biggest gauntlet, the, the worst gauntlet a big man has ever gone through in league history to win them, whilst also bearing the load on both ends in a carry job that the league had never really seen before. Don't ever try and justify what some guy in a Cleveland jersey who holds the ball up too much, who plays for his stats and negates his teammates' ability, ever did. Because, ladies and gentlemen, in summary, it was a bigger carry job than LeBron James has ever ever done like the video leave a comment and let me know what you think subscribe to the channel hit me up on my twitter i don't care facts are facts the statements i've made are true and it's absolutely simple in black and white no gray area whatsoever hakeem elijah carrying the 93-4 and 94-5 rockets is a bigger carrier job than lebron james and is arguably the biggest carry job in league history no big in history has gone through a more tougher run in playoff series against bigs in all-time competition than Elijah Wan did in 93-4 and 94-5. Again, hit the like button, subscribe to the channel, give me your feedback, hit me up on Twitter, Justin underscore G underscore Brian. I am done with this crap about LeBron James.